When you suggest to people that their money should be gold or silver coin, as it says in the Constitution, they sometimes stare at you with a blank expression or make the most extraordinary comments. Do you feel that our paper currency should still be backed by gold or silver? Uh, I think there should be a backing for currency. Otherwise, there's a temptation to run it out and uh, make too much of it. I'm not really sure what you mean. Um, like change the color of our money or something? or I buy silver. Gold. I don't know a lot about this subject, but I would say be just because of counterfeit. I think it should, but unfortunately it isn't. Okay, why do you think it should? I don't think the current system uh, is stable. These statements by everyday American citizens show how little people understand the intentions of the Founding Fathers. As the Constitution itself says, it is the supreme law of the land. And therefore the Constitution ranks ahead of any statutes of Congress, any statutes or constitutions for that matter of the states, and decisions of the courts. And any law or decision of the courts that is inconsistent with it is to that extent void. It's not a law at all. So what's going on here? Why does the Constitution clearly state that our money shall be coin Yet we are using government-issued, supposedly official, paper dollar bills. And we can't even redeem these for silver any longer. And why does Thomas Jefferson, the very man who drafted the Declaration of Independence and co-authored the U.S. Constitution, warn us about banks and corporations? Something is off here. The Federal Reserve System, to most people, seems like it is an agency of the federal government. That's what I thought it was when I first started to research this topic. But it turns out that it's nothing of the kind. The Federal Reserve is a hybrid organization. It's a partnership between the federal government and the private banks. When you look at it deeper than that, its essence is neither as a government agency or a private company. In reality, it is a cartel. In other words, it's no different in essence than a banana cartel or a sugar cartel or an oil cartel. It's a grouping of the large private corporations in the field, banking, who have come together to create agreement between themselves to limit competition, to preserve their profits, and to make sure that no newcomers come in and uh, take away their position. That's what cartels are always designed to do. And it's a shocking thing to realize that something as prestigious as the Federal Reserve System at its core is nothing more or less than a banking cartel with exactly those same objectives. The motivation for Congress to go into partnership with the elite bankers who formed the Federal Reserve is clear. Endless amounts of money could effectively be printed up and lent to Congress. Thus, individual congressmen would no longer be forced to depend on raising taxes to generate additional revenue, an unpopular action that can cost them re-election. Ironically, if there were no Federal Reserve, there may have been no need for an income tax. The country did fine without it for 137 years. The income tax amendment was introduced the same year the Federal Reserve System was formed, 1913. Coincidence? Prior to the formation of the Federal Reserve System, the country never did better. In fact, that was the problem, at least for the major banks. Capital formation, also known as savings, was happening all over America. Other than panics, many of which were caused by unethical lending practices, America was doing great. So much so, the big New York banks were losing business. But why isn't the mainstream media telling us this story? What would motivate them to refrain from a critical interpretation of banking history and the Federal Reserve System, especially today, when they broadcast critical, even intimate reports on every other aspect of life? I consider the Federal Reserve Act and the creation of the Federal Reserve as being unconstitutional. It gave 
the government then the power to create legal tender out of thin air, that is, to create paper money. And although they didn't do that overnight, between 1913 and 1971, that is exactly what happened. But the notion of a central bank does not fit into the Constitution. The Congress has the authority to coin money, and only gold and silver should be legal tender. And this is an absolute contradiction of the Constitution to have a Federal Reserve system and a central bank. Not a lot of American people understand it, and I would add that probably not too many people here in the Congress understand it either. I think they see it as a convenience, and I think a lot of other people see it as a convenience because they think they're protected by the type of system that we have. But a fiat monetary system or a paper money system is merely a system where the government has this power and authority to dictate and insist that a piece of paper is legal tender. And even members of the banking committee have come up to me and they say, you mean our dollar isn't backed by gold anymore? Uh, not realizing that the Federal Reserve really accommodates big government uh, bureaucrats and politicians. There's another major problem with the system in that the system is a cartel structure which means they've taken all the banks in the country and put them into one economic unit that's essentially regulated from the top by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Comes 1932-33 had the crash. Uh, the Roosevelt administration came in and one of the first important pieces of legislation that was passed was the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. And the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 did for all industries in the economy. The same thing that the Federal Reserve System did for the banks in 1913. It created a cartel structure. All the steel producers were in one group, poultry people were in another group, mining people were in another group, and on top of this whole thing was something that looked like the Board of Governors called the National Recovery Administration. The National Industrial Recovery Act was challenged as to its constitutionality, and a case went to the Supreme Court in 1935, the Schechter Poultry case. And the Supreme Court unanimously declared it unconstitutional. They said this kind of delegation of power by Congress to private parties is, and this is an exact quote, unknown to our law, unquote. You couldn't find it anywhere by any method of interpretation. It's simply unknown. Well, the difference between the National Industrial Recovery Act and the Federal Reserve Act is essentially zero. The peculiarity here is that the Federal Reserve Act has never gotten that question to the Supreme Court. Let's take a second look at the words of Thomas Jefferson, a deeper look at exactly who owns and operates the private banks known as the Federal Reserve System and what their mission statement might be.